Uh, Dr. Lisa Ritchie is the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Disasters and Extreme Events and Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at Oklahoma State University. During her career, Dr. Ritchie has studied a range of disaster events, including the Exxon Valdez, the Deepwater Horizon oil spills, the Tennessee Valley Authority coal ash release, Hurricane Katrina, earthquake, earthquakes in Hawaii and New Zealand, uh, lots of very interesting um, uh, tragedies. Uh, since 2000, her focus has been on the social impacts of disasters and community resilience with an emphasis on technological disasters, social capital, and renewable resource communities, and has, she has published widely on these topics. So we're very fortunate to have her here with us uh, from Oklahoma uh, to, t to uh, kind of help us think about these issues uh, before we do our discussion. So thanks very much. Well, thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate being here and I haven't spent much time on the East Coast, so it's a pleasure to see your beautiful environment and, and uh, to spend some time with you this afternoon. Uh, at this point, we've heard a lot about environmental impacts, public health impacts, economic impacts, and now what we're gonna do is turn our attention to some of the social impacts, the societal dimensions of marine oil spills and technological disasters. I will go ahead and apologize in advance. I've got a bit of a scratchy throat, so I might be sipping some water. Uh, do we have any social scientists in the room? We got two. Oh, that's awesome, yeah. So I'll be calling on you if I have any questions that I can't field, right? <laughs> so today what I'm going to do is share with you uh, about 20 years worth of empirical research, primarily funded by the National Science Foundation, on marine oil spills and technological disasters. I have had, as uh, was mentioned, uh, what I call a number of unfortunate opportunities to study these kinds of events and to hopefully pass along some information that can be of use in preparedness and response activities. So my point here is not to instill fear here, as many of you have already mentioned, that, that that's not what we're trying to do, but rather to foster awareness associated with these events and what might happen, the potential for social disruption in the wake of these events. So this is not gonna be news to any of you who have worked on some of the larger uh, spill events, so bear with me and chime in as you see fit at the end. Uh, but what I think is important today is that we consider the potential of social impacts in the context of what you all are doing as responders and as policymakers and as community representatives. So that's what I'd like us to focus on for the next few minutes. I did my dissertation research in Cordova, Alaska. Uh, I had a very uh, good experience there with people willing to share their experiences with me. I didn't start my research until 2001, so it was a long time after the spill. But what I noticed was that there were ongoing impacts associated with that spill, even though uh, the environmental impacts seemed to be subsiding, there were social consequences that we're still dealing with in some respects today. I've also studied the BP Deepwater Horizon event, uh, also with National Science Foundation funding, and they've been very supportive over the years as we've collected this longitudinal information. Uh, so not again just after the spill, but for years following to look at the chronic and long-term impacts. So what we know about the social impacts of marine oil spills builds on a long tradition of research on how uh, disasters in general, both natural and technological disasters, uh, affect society. So I'm gonna turn your attention here to this, what we call continuum of deliberateness. So this is the extent to which any given event or act is a deliberate one or unintentional. So over on the left-hand side, we have what we refer to as acts of God or natural disasters. And typically we think of these as hurricanes or tornadoes or earthquakes not caused by uh, hydraulic fracturing processes. Over on the far right, we have what we would consider the purposive premeditated acts like terrorism and mass shootings, that kind of thing. But what I'm gonna do today is focus on this middle section, human events uh, caused by error, or recreancy. And recreancy is basically the notion that somebody was responsible, someone or some party was responsible for the event occurring. 
And it's important to recognize that these events, particularly the natural and the technological events, aren't distinct specifically. They have overlapping qualities and characteristics as we saw so much uh, following Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, and others. So what are we talking about when we talk about technological events? It's things like Love Canal, Three Mile Island, the TVA coal ash spill, and others that you see here. And something like the Flint, Michigan water crisis is ongoing, as you know from the media. So what I'm looking at here is psychosocial stress, and that's the interrelation between social factors and individual thoughts and behaviors. So the next few slides uh, look at key issues associated with technological disasters. As we've heard already most of the day, a lot of what we're dealing with is uncertainty. How bad is it? How much was spilled? What are the physical impacts? What are the environmental impacts? What are the public health impacts? What are the economic impacts? Okay, so there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. And what we know about uncertainty is that it causes stress. Okay. We also have contested interpretations of the event. Again, maybe whose fault is it? What is the scope of this disaster? How long is it going to last? What are the public health effects? We also have something that we refer to as loss of control versus lack of control. In what we see as acts of God, most of those are perceived as being having a lack of control. We simply don't have any control over a hurricane. We don't have control uh, over a tornado and the impacts of that necessarily. In technological disasters, what we typically have is a belief that we had control over the technology. We had double hull tankers. We had response plans, that we had some kind of control over these events. But in fact, what we experience afterwards is the notion that people lost control. And once again, that's a driver of stress. The issue related to primary responsible parties, which we've talked about already today, that there is in fact some party to hold responsible and someone or some entity to place the blame on. And of course, the response processes are different from natural disasters. You have local people involved, you have outsiders coming in, you know, so these kinds of things um, uh, involving uh, local folks in cleanup efforts where there are hazardous materials involved. We've talked about those and we've heard about some of the challenges associated with that. We have social vulnerability to environmental hazards. There are a lot of times when people who are the most socially vulnerable are in the wake of these kinds of events and we need to pay specific attention to those. You know, so we're seeing new kinds of vulnerable populations, particularly those associated with renewable resources and those who are heavily dependent upon them for not only their economic survival and livelihood, but for their cultural survival and their way of life. We have what we call corrosive communities developing in the larger spill events in particular and the technological disaster events in particular. And that's when there are existing social fissures, maybe uh, two different groups don't get along already. And then we see that exacerbated when there's a stressful situation. When we have natural disasters, we see the opposite. And you probably witnessed this as you've looked at different kinds of natural events where there's a coming together of the community and that there is more of what we call a therapeutic community. And outsiders come in to help with good intentions. And in this situation, we have um, with technological disasters, a lot of times when, when folks are coming in for the money, you know, there are disaster capitalists out there um, who are coming in from outside the local community, perhaps preempting local individuals uh, from working on the Vessels of Opportunities program. So these kinds of things, again, I'm pulling in some of the things that we've talked about as being potential research projects, pilot projects, and things we need to mo know more about, particularly at the local level. We have boom and bust cycles. Our economist has left at this point, uh, but we see in the wake of uh, technological disasters that we can have a lot of influx of money uh, to support the cleanup activities, but when that goes away, sometimes other things don't return. So we need to think about that. Community ties to the environment, we've heard a lot about that today. 
Uh, there are many ways for communities to have a relationship with the environment, the beach economies, the tourism, uh, the subsistence activities that go on, the recreational activities that go on, the commercial fishing and other forms uh, of activities that we see that tie communities very specifically to their environment. Uh, and when that is disrupted as a result of toxic contamination, we have a lot of social disruption in that respect as well. We've talked a little bit about the different kinds of oil and what you can see and what you can't see, uh, what we can see with respect to toxic contamination and not. We have what's called the invisible trauma to the natural environment and sometimes also to the social environment. So this notion that you may or may not be able to see it, you know, the tests of industry may not agree with the tests of government officials and independent academic scientists. So again, contested interpretations of what's actually going on. We have what's been discussed as secondary trauma as a res result of the bureaucratic processes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards, particularly the claims processes, community members not understanding the incident command system, and those kinds of things that cause confusion and additional social disruption, uh, especially litigation processes. We've talked already about the potential and the concern for long-term adverse health outcomes, uh, which seem to be assuaged by some of the comments we heard earlier, but those are still perceived in communities irrespective of what the science might say. We have long-term lack of closure you know, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, we just finished our study uh, back in 2010 as the Deepwater Horizon hit. Uh, so we looked at this, the team that I was part of, I started again in 2001, but there had been a team studying it since 1989, looking at the chronic long-term stress and social disruption in the community of Cordova, Alaska. When we have this lack of closure, communities have a difficult time moving on. There might be some who can move on, but particularly when there are small communities affected like Cordova was, a community of 2,500 people, you know, there are constant reminders. There's a white noise uh, of disruption associated with the Exxon Valdez oil spill that has only recently started to subside based on our empirical evidence and our survey research and our qualitative research in the community. And this notion of recovery, you know, we, we talked about what recovery is for the environment. What is recovery for the community? You know, we have similar questions uh, in the context of uh, the social dimensions. So these key issues associated uh, with technological disasters in general are also closely linked to that which we see in the context of marine oil spills. So everything that I've just talked about uh, is things that we need to consider uh, as we look at the consequences for society uh, with respect to marine oil spills. So again, uh, most of the research that we have on the societal dimensions uh, of marine oil spills come from the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and more recently the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Some of our key findings associated with these two events, because we were able to do the long-term research on Exxon Valdez and the Deepwater Horizon, we have data that we can compare. We very specifically in our research use similar measures and metrics so that it would be possible to compare not only across marine oil spills, but across other technological disaster events uh, and look at the social impacts of those. So what we see um, among the strongest predictors of stress are things we've talked about today. Concerns about health and economic futures, economic loss for families, groups, and communities at large, these connections to renew renewable resources that we heard some about and I just mentioned. Exposure to the oil, again, whether you were directly or indirectly exposed, whether you were directly or indirectly exposed economically and had issues associated with that. And involvement with compensation processes. And especially given the breakout sessions and the results of that, this is really important to keep in mind. And this is one of my, um, pet projects, my research uh, inquiry arena right now that I'm looking at more closely. The recent research that we have, as well as that from the Exxon Valdez oil spill, suggests that after a certain amount of time, the compensation processes, whether it's claims or litigation or settlement processes, 
can be as stressful, if not more so, than the actual event itself. And let's think about that for a minute. A lot of the pilot, the research projects that you all came up with, talked about attending to how the claims processes might be fixed, adjusted, better explained to communities, and so forth, perhaps having even a mock compensation process go on as part of the spill drill situation, you know, so that people know what to expect. And so too, that primary responsible parties can step up to the plate so that government and decision makers can know what they might be facing. But these are things that we can attend to as citizens, as policymakers, as researchers supporting this line of inquiry as we move forward. Because this is something, again, that we could do something about. And having people understand that these processes that are supposed to alleviate economic issues are actually contributing to stress in other ways is something that's really important. Um, it's also important to note that even if you are not personally involved in a claim or part of the compensation process, that communities at large, the people that we surveyed and talked to who are not part of compensation are suggesting that stress in the community at large is elevated as a consequence of the community members other than themselves being involved in compensation. So I think that's something that's really sad, but also something uh, that we can continue to look at going forward. So these kinds of things highlight the chronic nature, the long-term nature of these types of events. So where are we now? What we're doing here, focusing on preparedness and awareness, understanding the best ways to communicate risk in local contexts and community settings, emphasizing the inclusion, as we've heard so often today, of local knowledge, whether it's local knowledge about the economy, about where the resources are, about the culture, the way people process things in local contexts, is something that we need to keep considering just as these oil spill workshops are doing around the country. We need to actively seek civic engagement and include the stakeholders, as I knew many of you were thinking about coming into this workshop. And I know that we have activities upcoming that are also going to focus on getting community members at large more involved, nonprofit organizations, foundations, those kinds of organizations uh, that can help reach the community and help the community have a voice beyond the professional responders and those of you who deal with this uh, on a more regular basis. And we need to make sure that we increase our understanding of the effectiveness of these different kinds of activities, mitigation, response, recovery, preparedness, involved in the societal dimensions of these kinds of disasters, these marine oil spills. And again, looking specifically at how compensation processes may be affecting communities as they move forward. And that's what I have for you this afternoon. I'll be happy to take any questions and look forward to hearing what comes of the breakout groups.